Well, good morning, Potter's Hand. Good morning. good morning, good morning. This is how you start today. We have baptism, and we are so excited to, uh, to share with you what's going on. I want to welcome all of you for being here, and if you're joining us online, we have campers, 15 of our very own kids are with some of our staff and volunteers. They are over at Camp Little Springs, and they're joining us a little bit later, so we want to wish them safe travel. Come back. We miss you already. First time I've ever been this away from my little boy, Milo. So please be praying for him. <laughs> we are in the baptismal waters. This is uh, affectionately been called the Holy Hot Tub. And today, we set a new record. As I look at the, the thermostat here, the little thermometer, we have hit 102 degrees. Whoa. Yes. Who would like to join me in here? This, this is awesome. In fact, I'm going to preach from here today. It's going to be an awesome day. My temperature's rising. We're excited. You know, anytime somebody's baptized, it's always a powerful statement. But there's something special when it's the adults that come forward and they make a profession of faith. Whether they've been saved as a, as a younger child or in their adulthood. But when they come forward and say, you know what? I want to follow the Lord of Believers' baptism. I haven't done that, or maybe I've done that prior, but I really want to make it a commitment. It's just something powerful when an adult does that. So our first person today is Ed McCauley. Ed, come on in, brother. We are so glad to have him and Teresa. His two sons are here today. So good to have you guys here. There you you sit right here. And if you, uh, if you haven't met Ed and Teresa, you need to. Two words, food. Okay? <laughs> They were the ones a few Wednesdays ago that cooked everything. They took care, they catered our entire Wednesday night refuel meal, and I gained seven pounds in 13 minutes, and it was fantastic. So we, we love you guys. You've been an awesome addition to our church family. Ed, it is an honor to baptize you today. I'm so proud of you. I know your family's proud of you. And uh, really, there's no higher honor to, to be able to baptize a brother in Christ and to say today to the world, we are all in. And that's what it's about. And that's what the world's looking for, for people to stand up, to boldly de de declare, no more playing around. We are all in. So today we're going to baptize Ed McCauley. Ed, it is my pleasure as your brother, as your pastor, as your friend, to baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Love you, buddy. God bless you. That's awesome. God bless you. Amen. And our next candidate for baptism is Tara Mills. Yes, give Tara a welcome as she comes in. You got it? Doesn't that feel good? Yes. 102. I wasn't lying, was I? I wasn't even speaking pastoral illustrations there. That was legit. This is Tara Mills. You all know her. She's been coming for years. We love her, her family. And Tara, we are proud of you and your declaration to make Jesus Lord of your life and to be all in. I think that's awesome. These are their shirts. They get to keep these as a, as a reminder of this moment, as a powerful reminder. So Tara, it's an honor as your brother, as your pastor, as your friend to baptize you this morning, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. Woo! <laughs> Amen. I love you. God bless you. It's awesome. Proud of you. Amen. And that is how we start church. Keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. Anytime you take a bold step for the Lord, the devil knows that. And you put that target on you. That's okay. We know that. We don't walk without armor. The Lord is in control. Let's pray, and then we'll have our time for offerings and tithes. Lord, you are so good. We give you our worship today, heartfelt and wholeheartedly. Thank you for the blessings to be able to follow you in Believer's Baptism, one of the two ordinances you gave us to, to follow, the Lord's Supper, and today with baptism. You are so worthy of our highest worship. We pray today that you would bless those who have been baptized, that you would give them boldness as they declare they are all in for you. And Lord, we pray today that our worship is sweet in your sight. Let it rise before you, a fragrant aroma, bringing you joy. You are our God, and we serve you. We worship you. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Good morning again. How are you? Happy, happy Sunday. Today marks a sad chapter, the end of our Strange Things trilogy. Unless, of course, you want more. 
because you know me, I got a lot of strange things, and uh, I love digging into these bizarre stories that, for whatever reason, you just never hear them preached about, or you never hear them studied about, or, or gone into these, these deeper topics, and, and I love it. But today, unless God changes it, today will be the final chapter of our strange things, what ended up being a trilogy, with a very bizarre story today. And I found the perfect setup for this. As we look around the world today, we see there is like a race in countries to see who has the biggest buildings or the, the tallest skyscraper, if you will. And right now, China has the record for the largest building per square footage, 5.5 million square feet. That's big. That's a big, that's like a mall and then some. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of space. Dubai has the distinction of having two records. Not only do they have the tallest hotel in the world, they have the tallest skyscraper. It stands at 2,722 feet. But there's something even more impressive on the horizon. In North Korea, they are building, I kid you not, an invisible skyscraper. They are building, not, not North Korea, <laughs> South Korea. South Korea is really in the, in the works. They have the engineers working on an invisible building. They even have a name for it. It's going to be called the Tower Infinity. And it is going to be massive and huge. But what makes this difference? They're not going to hide it underground or, you know, paint it blue. What they're going to do is use the same technology that our military uses with army tanks. They're going to cover this skyscraper with cameras all over it, aiming in every direction. And then on the opposite side, they're going to have LED screens on the entire surface of this. So what they're going to do is take real picture images and transmit them to the LED screens. So that when you're standing there, you're not seeing me, you're seeing a picture of what's behind me. So it looks like you're seeing through me. You want to see what it looks like? Well, I haven't built it yet. But <laughs> But there is an artist rendering, and it looks like this. On the left is what it looks like without the screens turned on. And on the right, you see when the LED screens are powered up to 100%. That's pretty cool, right? When this thing is built, it will be, no doubt, quite a sight. Or will it? There you go. Uh, see what we did there? Louise is on it. She's fired up today. This is perfect because this is what man does. We can camouflage things. We can hide things. We can keep things on the down low and hope nobody notices, hope nobody sees. But God's word is very clear. There is nothing hidden from him. We can't hide from God. And that's a great thing, but it should also be a little bit of a sobering thing. In fact, Luke goes on to say, there is nothing covered up now that will not be revealed later. Nothing hidden now that will not be made known. Ooh. Well, now... Now it's getting real. Today we're going to look at a story of a man who did something in secret. Something that he did, he did not want anyone to know about it. In fact, he knew it was something he shouldn't even be doing. But he does it anyway, and he tries to keep it on the down low. He tries to keep it, you know, hidden under wraps. And he begins sneaking around, and he uses things like the cover of darkness and disguises. This sounds like a, like a, a Mission Impossible spy theme, like born identity going on here. But what happens to this poor guy leads to absolute, total devastation in his life. And I mean total. And there is a powerful lesson. This isn't just studying ancient past, digging around in the dust. This is so applicable for us today, church. In fact, I almost called this message the downfall of King Saul. Because I like rhymes and I can remember those things. But there is so much going on even beyond Saul. It applies to us, especially the modern church. So open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 28 and hold your place there. Or pull up your favorite Bible app. I'm going to read from the NLT today. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus again. Great to have you with us each and every week. If you can't be here live, and we hope God's word will speak loud and clear to you today. 1 Samuel 28, and of course, it's important to set the context. Never pull something out of context. Always see what's going on around the scriptures you're looking at. The central figure of Samuel 28 is King Saul. And King Saul was the first king appointed by God over Israel. And things were going great. Saul was doing a good job, for the most part. Saul tried to seek after the Lord, for the most part. And he did pretty well. And he had God's blessings until he didn't. He had God's blessings until Samuel chapter 15 showed up. 
when God gave him specific directions, I want you to go with the army and annihilate the evil, wicked Amalekites. Destroy them and leave nothing standing. Destroy their king, destroy their livestock, destroy everything. Touch nothing. Don't loot them. Don't bring, oh, this is treasure. We'll take this. Nothing. Annihilate it. Carpet bomb. Boom. Be done with it. So, it's just one problem with Saul. He doesn't obey God 100%. He comes close. Oh, the battle, whoo, the battle went good for Saul. He annihilated just about all of the Amalekites. There was just one problem. Saul decided, for whatever reason, to let King Agag live, the evil Amalekite king. And then, to make it worse, he looted all of King Agag's best stuff. He took the best sheep and livestock and cattle and fatted calves, and he brought it back with him. And then the prophet Samuel shows up, and he lies to the prophet Samuel. And Samuel's not believing this. Samuel knows what's going on. Even though Saul tries to pull one over on a prophet of God, there's just something. Saul sees Samuel coming. Saul knows what he's done and what he hasn't. So Samuel comes, walking up to the battlefield, and Saul greets him with a big smile and says, Prophet Samuel, I am so glad to see you. I have great news. God has given us victory. We did exactly what God said. We've annihilated everybody, and it's awesome, and, and we did it, and God gave us favor, and isn't it great? Isn't it great? And Samuel says, what are you talking about? You didn't obey God. I, I can hear the sound of sheep in my ears. I hear them bleeding. Bah, bah, bah. Saul's a liar. And he's sitting there, and he, he says, he can, I can hear the sheep. And Saul does what many of us do. He says, what? <laughs> the, oh, those sheep. <laughs> yeah, about that. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to sacrifice those to you. They're for you. They're for God. I mean, we're going to feast. We're going uh, uh, to thank God for the victory. Yeah, yeah, that's it. We're going to do that. And the prophet Samuel, <laughs> let's just say he's not falling for it. He's like, what are you, what are you trying to say? How can you, y'all know, let's be honest, when you come home and your kids greet you at the door and they're just a little too excited to see you, they're like, dad's home, awesome. Dad, hey dad, how you doing? Can I take your briefcase? What'd you, can you need a foot rub? How about that? Oh, you look tense. How about some back hurts and shoulder? Oh, you have had a hard day. Can I get you anything? I hear the Bama game's on. Can I get you a Diet Coke? How, you got the new Striper album? This is going to be, it's a great day. They go on and you know something's up. You know they're guilty of something. You just don't know what it is yet. But you know it's not normal. They're just a little, and that's how Saul was with Samuel. He's like, Samuel, it's so good to see you. And then Samuel lays it out. And he pronounces a strong judgment on him. In fact, I have it here for you in 1 Samuel 15. He says, you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Until the day Samuel died, he never went to see Saul again. No, Samuel didn't mourn for him. And the Lord was grieved that he made Saul king over Israel. And from this moment forward, church, don't miss this. Saul's life was never the same. It was marked with fear and, and bitterness and jealousy and fits of rage. And he would go through mountaintops and then go through depression and paranoia. So fast forward a few years, Saul finds himself now in the battle of all battles with his dastardly enemy, the Philistines, of course, with Goliath and all those bad guys. He finds himself in a horrible battle, but he doesn't have a word from God, and he freaks out. Now this time, the prophet Samuel is dead. He's gone on. He's in Abraham's bosom. He's enjoying paradise, and Saul is desperate for a word from the Lord, so he does something he's not supposed to do, something evil something wicked, something explicitly forbidden. He consults a witch. And that's where we pick up the story today. Look with me, starting in 28, verse 3. Meanwhile, Samuel had died, and all of Israel had mourned for him. He was buried in Ramah, his hometown. Don't miss this next part. And Saul had banned from the land of Israel all mediums. Okay, if you're not familiar with that term, that's uh, psychics. Uh, witches, fortune tellers, soothsayers, uh, anything like that that dabbles with the occult in, in trying to, to, to tell the future and discern spirits like that, okay? And those who consult with spirits of the dead. Verse 4, 
The Philistines set up their camp at Shunem, and Saul gathered all the army of Israel and camped at Gilboa. These are very close together, by the way, separated just by, a, just by a few miles. When Saul looked out and saw the vast Philistine army, he became frantic with fear. So he asked the Lord, what should I do? But the Lord refused to answer him, either by dreams or by sacred lots like the Urim or by the prophets. So right off the bat, we see something very interesting here. We see a, a regression of Saul. There's a slippery slope that's about to happen in three phases that he just goes from here to here to down here, and then total devastation. The first thing he does is the right thing, and he tries to talk to God. He tries to pray, and that's good. That's appropriate. He goes to the Lord, and he tries to get a word from him that's acceptable, and that's right, except for when God doesn't answer. Now, why doesn't he hear back from the Lord? Saul's heart was not right with God. You ever been there? You ever had sin in your life where you just, you felt like your prayers were not getting any higher than the ceiling? There's no way God's going to answer me. I mean, after what I've done or all the good I should have done that I didn't, I mean, there's, you know, it was a barrier to him. And it frustrated him. And rightfully so. Now, right then and there, he could have repented, confessed his sin, and quite possibly the Lord would have answered his prayers and we never would have seen what happens next. But that doesn't happen because his sin is a barrier from hearing from God. So secondly, look what he does. After he can't hear from God, he lowers his standards a little bit, and he seeks some form of dream revelation. Now, on the surface, we think, well, okay, no big deal, right, Pastor? I mean, God does speak through dreams. We see it from time to time in visions, and he gives people insight that way. Here's the problem. That is on the Lord's timetable, and that is at the Lord's behest when he gives a vision. Saul had forgotten this. Saul was treating the Lord's visions and dreams as if he was a genie. I'm going to rub the lamp, and God, I need a vision. I need a vision right now. <laughs> Can you, and I, I'm not even sleepy, but I need a dream. Would you please give me? And he doesn't hear anything, so guess what they do next? This is very common. When somebody is desperate to hear something from the Lord, many times they take another step and lower their standards even more, and they take a hallucinogenic, whether it's a pill or, a, or they eat something or they drink something to help, help uh, manufacture this uh, dreamlike trance. And they go into almost a drug-induced trance in which the dreamer is just hoping he'll see something from the future that he can go, that's it. <laughs> that's got to be from God. Here's the problem. Drugs don't bring you closer to the Lord. It doesn't matter if it's legal or not. Drugs don't bring you closer to the Lord. In fact, they further cloud your mind from hearing God. When you allow these things and you're not in control of your mental faculties, guess what? You open yourself up to lots of things, to your own delusions, to other people's insights that may be horrible wisdom, where, where if you were in full control, you would have said, uh, bad idea, no thanks. Or you get so far gone, you can open yourself up to demonic influence, none of which is something we should aspire to. So Saul is going down the slippery slope, and he still doesn't hear it, so he does a third descending and his unraveling. When the dreams didn't work and the prayers didn't work and the visions didn't work, he lowers his standards yet again, and he consults the Urim. And he didn't do it like a high priest would. All right? If you're not familiar with the Urim, it's often mentioned in conjunction with the Thumi. Two flat disks, two stones that the high priest would use. And if you remember the high priest when he would wear the ephod, and he had that beautiful breastplate with the 12 stones representing the tribes of Israel, and, and it was beautiful, and it helped him remind who to pray. The, the Thumim and the Urim were flat disks likely to be used to, to discern God's will. There's still some discussion about it where one side would say yes and the other would say no. And they had two. And when they cast them out, if they both agreed, there's your answer. But when one disagreed, they said, that's not from the Lord, and they sought further guidance. But the high priest used them. And he used them, ostensibly, at the Lord's behest. Saul didn't. Saul started treating these as if they were fortune-telling stones, like, like modern-day tarot cards or, or going to a Ouija board or trying to consult a psychic and have your palm read, or the astrology, or your horoscope. Oh, i got to find out what's going on. Y'all, all of that is bad news for a follower of Christ. That is not where we are supposed to be seeking our wisdom at all. These things have become so acceptable, not only back then, but today. They have become so normalized that good, God-fearing people dabble with this all the time, thinking it's just harmless fun. And in fact, years ago, it led me... To, to accept the honor to, I got to direct 
a feature-length film that was nationally distributed called Paranormal, and it dealt with this exact uh, theme, if you will. And Tion, our great co-leader here and, 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 and tech genius, was the executive producer. And this thing went viral. It went crazy. It did so well. It made somebody a lot of money. It wasn't us, but whoever distributed that is doing well. You're welcome. And this movie hit such a nerve because it tore the mask off and the truth exposed the darkness of what people were dealing with. And you all remember that scene? We had Rusty Martin, who was in Courageous. He was the guy. You see him on the left there. We were playing with his Ouija board, and we had this real powerful scene. If you remember Wayne Holt, and that's his daughter, Rachel Holt, right there. And we had this thing, and we had magnets, and this Ouija board slid all over, and it was freaky, and we had ghosts appearing, and all kinds of trying to show that what you think you're dealing with is not your great Aunt Sally from beyond the grave. And it was powerful. And it hit such a nerve, and youth pastors were saying, thank you for doing this. I've got kids that are doing this. And man, I grew up playing with this kind of stuff. And I didn't realize what I was doing until I looked at Scripture and saw that God hates it. And there's a reason. And I'm going to tell you that reason. It's not what you think it is at the very end. It is so powerful. So Saul is doing things that he thinks he's, he's either going to get away with, or God doesn't really mind, or God's going to look and go, eh, I'm going to wink at that sin, no big deal. Here's the problem. It's not a small thing to God, and it begins to unravel his world. And this is where things begin to get a little dark and a little creepy. Enter the witch of Endor. Saul makes a statement to his advisors in verse 7. He says this, Find me a woman who is a medium, so I can go and ask her what to do. His advisors replied, Ah, oh, hey, there's one right over here at Endor. <laughs> There's so much wrong in that sentence. We're going we're to address that. There's so much wrong. But I've got to address the elephant in the room here because we have a lot of Star Wars fans that are giggling right now because when you hear the word Endor, you immediately think the forest moon of Endor where we met the Ewoks. I'm sorry, this is not a sermon about that. But I do want points for working in yet another Star Wars reference right there, okay? It's not about that. This is about consulting a witch at the city of Endor, a medium. And Saul goes out, and there is, there is so much wrong with this right off the bat. Something I never dawned on me till, till just this week as I researched this. Saul had banned all mediums. In fact, anyone who practices witchcraft, it was illegal. He knew it. Everybody knew it. Isn't it interesting that in spite of this ban, Saul's advisors knew exactly where to find one? Does, does that dawn on anybody's mind? Like, <laughs> I banned it. It's illegal. I can't. If anyone of it, you will be stoned if you. Do you, you know where one is? Right there? Okay, let's go. And it's just like, yeah, we know where one is. She's right over here in that door. Isn't that strange? Y'all, don't miss this. There's a hidden gem right here. What kind of advisors is Saul surrounding himself with? That they are flirting with wickedness. That they, oh, Saul, we know it's illegal. It's illegal. <laughs> you want one? Right here. Who you surround yourself with matters. Young people, hear me. Who you listen to for advice matters. Who you give your ear to matters. Seek godly counsel. The fact that you're here today listening and going to Bible studies and small groups shows me your heart is in the right place. And you, you hopefully are surrounding yourself and letting God's truth drip into your ears and not having that giant doggy cone thing that just says, yeah, drip here. Drip your poison. Drip your lies. This is a very revealing moment. And from this moment, it gets worse and worse for Saul, and it just becomes tragic. Now, he goes and consults a medium. And if you're not sure what that is, again, that's a fortune teller. They practice fakery. And they practice pretending, telling a person what they want to hear, and gladly taking their money. They're happy to take your money. Or, when things really turn dark, they contact what the Bible calls familiar spirits. Well, this is where you've really done a no-no. Familiar spirits are demonic entities that are enabled to, to come to the medium and mimic a personality or to mimic a familiar situation to where that person says, oh, I think that's them. When the medium allegedly contacts these familiar spirits, they can appear to know things. They can appear to have insight and information from beyond the grave. And that's what somebody who's desperate wants to hear. Do you see how it feeds? You want to hear this? They have some information, and they can fake the rest. There's just one problem with this. Saul knew this is a no-no. He knew the scriptures. He full well knew about Deuteronomy 18 that says this, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium, 
or a spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is slightly annoying to the Lord. Oh, yours doesn't say that? What's the word? Detestable. Well, now we're not kidding around. This is something God hates, something he abhors. It is detestable. To, look how God compares it. Notice the first, the second sentence. He compares it with those who sacrifice their children. They would do that to the, to the evil god Molech, and they would give their babies to the fire. Incredible wickedness. And God, God compares consulting mediums in witchcraft. He says, it is an abomination to me. So right there is a huge takeaway for us. Saul knew that it was wrong, but he chose to do it anyway. Ooh. Uh-oh. <laughs> now, we don't do that. We don't ever know something's wrong and do it anyway. So you're safe here. This is just about Saul. Right? Right? You don't have to worry about this because that would hit very close to home. This is, this is we're just going to peek in on Saul's horrible, pathetic, miserable, sinful life, and we're just going to judge him right now because it is incredible that somebody who knows the Lord would ever know something is wrong and choose to do it anyway. It's awfully quiet in here. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's God convicting every one of us. And if you're not quite sure that Saul knows this is wrong, look at what he says next in verse 8. So Saul disguised himself by wearing ordinary clothing instead of his royal robes, and then he went to the woman's house when? At night, accompanied by just two of his men. This verse alone should reveal to us how desperate and how disobedient Saul was willing to be at this moment. This is powerful. Don't miss this. His desperation led to an even greater disobedience. Here's what you may not understand about the city of Endor. For Saul to go and consult this witch, he had to take drastic situations and go under the cover of darkness. And guess what? To get to Endor, guess where he had to go? This is, this is hilarious. He had to go through the Philistine camp that he was afraid of. Endor was over there by Ryan. Here's Gilboa, and he has to go through the Philistine camp. The one he's terrified of. The one he looked at and said, oh, I need a sign. How do I beat this huge army? So he has to sneak through this. What makes it even more crazy is he disguises himself. He takes off his kingly robes. He takes off all the things that identify him. And he disguises himself. That's a dead giveaway. When you have to disguise yourself, something might be up. Now, why did he do that? Obviously, the Philistines are going to be scouting and patrolling, not be caught. But guess what? I wonder if it's so he doesn't get caught by his own people. Think about it. Here's King Saul, you know, puts his hood up. He's sneaking through, hunting wabbits, and he's going through the valley. And here's his vast Israel army. They're like, hey, Saul, what? what's that? Who? No, I'm not Saul. Who? You're Saul. I'm not Saul. You know, it just kind of deflected, go away. You kind of look like our king. You kind of, kind of look funny to him. Nope, not me, not me. Saul would have his bodyguard with him. That's another thing he does that further puts himself at risk. He leaves his royal retinue, his entire regiment of bodyguard, and he just takes two people, only further heightening his risk. And he has to go six miles through the enemy camp and then two additional miles to get to Endor. All of this at night, under the cover of darkness by foot. This is incredible. And when he gets there, he tells the witch this. I have to talk to you. I got to talk to a man who has died. Will you call up his spirit for me? Are you trying to get me killed? The woman demanded. You know that Saul has outlawed all the mediums and all who consult the spirits of the dead. Why are you setting a trap for me? Do, good night. Even the wicked witch knows this is wrong. Th don't miss this. You know it's bad when you go to the bad guy and the bad guy says this is bad. <laughs> you sure you want to do this? Because I think we're going to get killed. This is illegal. Even the witch knew it. And Saul is turning down. Y'all, this is warning sign after warning sign, is it not? Bright light, be do be wrong way. Don't go. Crash through that one. Stop. Do not go. This is detestable. It's bad. Crash through that one. I can't hear you. La 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 la. We now that we don't we don't do that. <laughs> but poor wretched Saul does. Maybe there is an example there for us. This is crazy. 
Saul is walking in blatant disobedience. And watch what he does next, okay? The witch is worried she's going to get in trouble, okay? And he says, he says this in verse 10. Saul takes an oath in the name of the Lord and promises, As surely as the Lord lives, nothing bad will happen to thee for doing this. And he always speaks like that because I heard him once. That's, that's how he talks. And there it is, the most ironic statement of the century. Saul, the king, swears an oath to protect a medium, and he swears to the very Lord who condemns using a medium. Did you catch that? D don't miss how ironic and how sad this episode is. This is what sin does, church. Don't miss this. This is what sin does. Saul is blatantly walking in disobedience now. Blatantly walking disobedience to the Lord, and then he swears by that same Lord to assure the wicked medium she's safe. And he says, nothing's going to happen to you, even though Levitical law, which everybody knew, dictates she be stoned. And Saul says, no, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. You're safe. I got this. He doesn't have that. That's not up to him. These are holy laws now. There's so much going wrong. Y'all, stand back and look at how far Saul has fallen. And we're not even done yet. This is the mighty downfall of King Saul. Read with me what happens next, verse 11. Finally, the woman said, all right, fine. Whose spirit do you want me to call up? Call up Samuel, Saul. He doesn't even wait. Call up Samuel. When, so apparently she does, verse uh, 12. When the woman saw Samuel, she screamed. Ah, you've deceived me. You're Saul. There's so much strange stuff in this sentence when you unpack this. First off, I have to ask you guys, why in the world does this woman scream? What a strange response from a witch, a medium, who's used to doing this. This is what she does. This, is, this should be old hat. This should be, uh-huh, what do you need? Uh-huh, yeah, we'll fake it, good. Five dollars, please. Take it and send him on his way. This is what she does. She's used to this spiritual interaction. This is how we know something's different. This is how we know something is wrong. Something is up. This interaction is different. When she screamed, no doubt, unexpected, she did not expect to call up anything other than her familiar spirit, who probably she has worked with, some demonic entity who would pretend to offer some wisdom or some vice or some insight, some message from Samuel, but it didn't happen this way. Something was different. This, does not, this typical seance that she was holding just went off the rails, and it freaked her out. Someone who dabbles with darkness just got frightened. Why? Because this was not going the way she thought it would. Seances can take a turn for the dark like that. There's a great, hilarious story about some fakery that happened where a woman goes to the local psychic, this medium, and she wants to contact her dearly just departed grandmother. She's a young granddaughter, and she says, please help me. Help me. I want to talk to my grandmother one more time. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. And the psychic says, absolutely. And her eyelids begin to flutter, and she raises her hands over her table and her tarot cards and her crystal ball. And she begins fluttering and moaning and putting on all this stuff. And then a voice comes out of her and says, Granddaughter, are you there? And that granddaughter's eyes got so wide. Grandmother, is that you? Yes, my child, it is me. Grandmother, is it really you? I said it was really me, my granddaughter. The woman paused for a moment and said, Well, Grandmother, I just have one question for you. Anything, my child, ask. When did you learn to speak English? <laughs> Uh-oh, busted, busted fakery. Saul and that medium were probably going to expect to have a simple transaction, hear what he wanted to hear, he'd give some money, and he would go on his way, and she would be fine. But that didn't happen. She screamed. Something caught her off guard. This text seems to indicate that, much to her surprise, God did something very rare here. And he actually, for some reason, allowed Samuel's spirit, apparently, to return to deliver one final message to the rebellious Saul. And it was a doozy. And that's why she screamed. She was, in all her past, she had never channeled a real spirit from the past. You don't do that. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord or to be separated from the Lord. We don't linger, we don't hang out, we don't <laughs> shake chains. Boom, you're with the Lord or you're not. But you, you're not trapped here. And 
She was expecting to conjure that familiar spirit who would gladly pretend to give her whatever info she wanted. That keeps her in bondage too, by the way, to the occult. That didn't happen. She sees something she doesn't usually see. It appears to be Samuel the prophet. Even the tone of what Samuel says sounds just like Samuel. And he goes and he predicts future prophetic things that are about to happen, and he's right. So apparently, seeing Samuel, she connects the dots and says, Samuel, Saul says, you're Saul. Oh my goodness, you're Saul. You deceived me. Look what Samuel says to Saul next, verse 15. Why have you disturbed me by calling me back? Samuel asked Saul. I love this. Uh, because I was in trouble. The Philistines are at war with me. God's left me. I won't reply. The prophets have dreamed. I've prayed. I've tried everything. And now I've called for you. Please tell me what to do. Notice what Saul does right away. Well, we don't do this, but notice what he does. He begins to justify his actions. Uh, you, you don't understand. I, I just had to call you. But have you seen the Philistine army? Have you seen that big Goliath guy? I mean, what are we going to do? This is, this is crazy. He justifies breaking more rules just because he's in a tough spot. Just because, oh, I'm in a difficult situation. Maybe perhaps now's a good time for me to ask if you won't throw something at me. Do you do that? <laughs> do you justify? Yeah. God, you don't understand. It, it's different this time. I'm in a terrible spot. I have to lie. You don't understand. I, I have to cheat on my spouse. You, I just have to. You, you don't understand. I, I don't like the government. I am cheating on my taxes and keeping more of it. I am justifying this. Never mind, render under Caesar what is Caesar. <clears throat> Man, y'all are quiet today. <laughs> it's so interesting what Saul does to justify what is blatant and explicit sin. Notice what Samuel says next, verse 16. Samuel replies, why are you asking me? The Lord's left you. <laughs> you become his enemy. The Lord has done just as he said he would. He's torn the kingdom from you, and he's given it to your rival David. The Lord has done this to you today because you refuse to carry out his fierce anger against the Amalekites. What's more, the Lord will hand you and the army of Israel over to the Philistines tomorrow. And wait for it. Here's, here's the grenade. Oh, and you and your sons will be here with me tomorrow. Can you imagine that? The Lord's going to bring down the whole army. Verse 20. Saul falls full length on the ground paralyzed with fear because of Samuel's words. Evidently, Samuel is not playing around. Not only does he not tell Saul what he wants to hear, he, he says, but why you got me conjured up? Let me, let me give you just a little bit of a little bit of prophecy what's about to happen. You're going to die. And your kids, on your kingdom, yeah, it's gone. All of that. No wonder Saul falls down like a dead man. And he lays in front of this vision. We've got a picture of this that just shows it's so powerful, this painting. The news is devastating. He collapses as a dead man, paralyzed with fear. This one comes up. I mean, he names David by name. He alludes to him. He talks about Saul's failure to annihilate King Agag and Malchus. No wonder Saul took this warning so seriously. Samuel says it as bluntly as he can. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. And guess what? The next day, the prophecy comes true. Saul's mortally wounded, and eventually he falls on his own sword. Within 24 hours, he is done. And there it is. The devastation is total. It has absolutely been a cataclysmic downfall of King Saul. Right before our eyes. Total devastation. But here's the tragic part, and don't miss this. It could have been avoided. It could have been avoided. Think about this. So what about you? What can you take away from this strange story? What can you take away to help us all live more like Christ? Because that's what matters now. How do we look at this? As we look at the tragic downfall of King Saul and the witch of Endor, here are the lessons for us. I'm going to leave you with three practical things that you can do today. Here is your challenge. If you'll take these and go with them, they will help you walk more like Christ. Number one, remove any barrier that hinders your relationship with God. 
Because that's what unraveled this whole thing from the beginning. If his sin had been confessed, he would have heard from the Lord. What is it that is likely separating you right now from clear and open communication with the Lord? Ask yourself that. And you're safe here. You're allowed to find that out. We all have that from time to time. That happens. Confess it. That's what, that's what the verse says. His barrier was unconfessed sin. Look at this verse in Isaiah. She says, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away from you, and he will not listen anymore. Man, that's powerful. Practical application for us all. Number two, refuse to allow any evil to influence your life in any way. Ooh, well, that's big. That's broad and encompassing. Yeah. The New Testament says it very clearly. Don't even give the devil a foothold. Not even a toehold. Why would you dabble with this stuff? When we open the door to things like that, we expose ourselves to, to false truth, whether it's simple things that are goofy, tarot cards, horoscopes, Paul reading, seances, communicating with psychics, media, you know the psychic network? Remember that? Remember Dionne Warwick? The psychic friends network, you could call in and do that? Guess what? It went bankrupt. You would have thought they would have seen it. Uh, is it just me? Think about this. Even they didn't see this coming. It's such fakery, unless you've tapped into the demonic world, in which case God says it's detestable. Do not play with that. Now, here's why. I told you I'd promise you I'd, I'd tell you why. Here's why it's such a big deal, okay? This is huge. This, this classifies as a full-blown truth grenade, okay? You ready for it? Even if you say, seek information, and it may appear to be helpful at first, Here's what happens, little by little, and it may be where you don't even realize it's happened. You begin to find yourself seeking answers, seeking wisdom from a source other than God. That's idolatry. That's punishable by death in the Old Testament times. That's idolatry. That's putting, taking God off his rightful place as Lord of your life, his throne, when you say, I'm all in, and saying, <laughs> I'm all in, but I need an answer, and you're not giving it to me. Hey, little creepy lady, how about you tell me something here? Light some smoke, and we'll do something. The table's going to levitate and all this stuff. No, a thousand times, no. God says, don't do that. You're opening yourself up to demonic things. There, there's a God, little G, behind that, I'll guarantee you. It's a demonic force saying, yes, worship me. Uh, anything to take the attention off of Yahweh Elohim. Because they're mad. They can't stand what's happened. They know their future. They know a lake of fire awaits them. Yeah, it's real. This is incredible. When we dabble, we seek wisdom and advice from someone other than God, y'all, that's an affront to him. The believers, we should never do that. We don't need it. We could go to the source. We have to have patience. He may not answer on your timeline, but that's where the maturity comes in, which leads us to point three, and then I'm done. Seek a deeper relationship with God, and you'll find what you've been looking for. There it is. It all comes down to this. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. There it is. The practical application from a story three and a half thousand years ago still relates today, still speaks today. God's word is so clear. And he has spoken today. My question is, how will you respond? Let's pray. God, I thank you that your word is alive and cuts like a two-edged sword as you promised it would. Able to separate bone and marrow. Able to get to the core of our hearts. Lord, you, you gaze at us and you lay us bare. There is nothing hidden from your sight. And Lord, while that honestly thrills me, it also terrifies me. And I thank you, Lord, that in a group of my friends here today, we can be open and honest and candid with you to confess our sin individually, corporately. And Lord, we repent of that. Bring it to our minds so that we can confess it and you can move that barrier and we can be in fellowship with you again. God, I thank you that you didn't give up on us. Thank you for being a God of second and third and fourth chances and on and on. Lord, you are so good. You're worthy of our worship today. Thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for giving us your word to speak loudly. We love you. We pray in your name. Amen.